Welcome everybody to another video here today on the channel and it is another special one with a very special guest. Peyton from Peyton on the radio is joining me here and we're going to be talking about the Edmonton Oilers in their off season, what the outlook is mm. heading into this coming year for the Oilers coming off a pretty successful season this past year, making it to the Western Conference final. So Peyton, it's awesome to have you, man. Thank you so much for coming on. And are you ready to talk some Oilers hockey? Oh, I think I always am. I, I love talking Oilers hockey. I, I probably could talk about them all damn day. I could talk about them for hours, for hours and hours, especially when it's in the off season. I, I love building plans and talking about the moves that they recently did. And I was a real big fan of what Holland did this off season for the first time in a long time. Yep. All right, man. Well, everybody, Peyton's channel, Peyton on the radio, will be linked in the description. So be, for, be sure to go check all that, of his great content out. And uh, Peyton, and I guess to, before we get into some of the changes made, I want to talk about last year, conference mm -hmm. finals. Uh, I don't think too many people saw that coming. Certainly not mid-year when the Oilers were seventh in the division right before Tippett <laughs> got fired. Uh, what a run after Jay Woodcroft took over and, and they yeah. were able to carry that all the way through to the final four. Yeah, I felt like we were going to be able to do that because Jay Woodcroft is, a, a, I got to say, a really good coach, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the way that I seen him in Bakersfield and, and what he did with when he took over the team. He was just uh, really good. He had a good structure. I thought he had a better structure than what Tippett had with the team. He played the better players. Uh, and yeah, I didn't even expect us. I was like, you know, we'll probably make it to the second round. We'll probably lose out in the second round to the Calgary flames, but then for us to steamroll yeah. the Calgary flames, of course, getting swept by the Colorado avalanche was going to happen. I mean, they were such a dominant team throughout the entire season. It was going to be a hard team to beat. So us just making it to the conference finals is, is really great, especially with the goaltending that we had and not the best defensive core either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you just mentioned goaltending and that brings yeah. us to what I would say is probably the biggest move, most important move that Edmonton has made. Mm -hmm. And that is that they signed Jack Campbell. It was the first signing as soon as free agency opened, yeah. literally 12 o'clock Eastern on the dot Campbell five-year deal to the Edmonton Oilers. And uh, this was, I, I think, in my opinion, certainly the biggest question mark with Edmonton yes. was their goaltending, you know, before they had that duo of Mike Smith and Miko Koskinen. Yeah. And I just felt like that wasn't going to be good enough to get them to the promised land. So they go out, they get Jack Campbell, who's coming off a very strong year with Toronto. He was, you know, him and Darcy Kemper, easily the two best goaltenders on the oh, market. Yeah. And they bring in their, their goalie, their guy, their number one. How are you mm -hmm. feeling about Campbell taking over here in Edmonton? You know, I'm really excited uh, with Jack Campbell. He is an inconsistent goaltender, mm -hmm. though. That's that's the biggest issue with him coming to the team. This is was his first year where he almost hit 50 games as yep. a goalie. So majority of his career has only been playing, you know, 20 to 30 games. So we're definitely taking a big risk with paying him for the five for five without a doubt. But this could work out kind of like how Jacob Markstrom kind of worked out for the Flames. When the Flames first picked him up, they were like, it was, he was inconsistent. There was a lot of issues with Jacob Markstrom before he went to the Flames. Now he's a pretty solid goaltender there. And I think that's going to be the same way with Campbell. He had an amazing start to the season. He had like a 939 save percentage for the, the Leafs at the beginning of the season. He was a Vesna caliber goalie. And then the second half of the season, he was an 889 save percentage and kind of went downhill. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to the others, you know, it, it's going to be tough because I, I think we still need to upgrade our defense a little bit. Yep. And I think with Campbell, he's, he's going to have to play with a worse defensive core without a doubt. But I think Jack Campbell will be our guy, uh, especially with Stuart Skinner backing him up. I think we have a really good tandem going into this upcoming season. Yeah, I, I mean, Campbell's a guy that seems – I like the Marstrom comparison because they he's a late bloomer, the way yeah. that Markstrom was very much a late bloomer. And we haven't gotten a huge sample size of him as a starter, but we've yeah. seen some really good flashes of what he can be. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the biggest mo – most interesting things to see with the Oilers is now that they know he's the number one – 
you know, how is he going to handle that? And is what's going to happen when he has to play, you know, 50 games or 55 games, Yeah, you know, is he going to handle that workload? Well, and I'm excited to see that. Cause I think the upside is there with Campbell in the Oilers. And he fits so well in the locker room, Zach yeah. Hyman and Campbell were best of friends. And yeah. I, I love the memes of all the, the Leafs fans dogging on us for picking up all the Leafs. Thanks Leafs fans for being our farm team. Thank you very <laughs> much guys. I uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, for Cabell and everyone else. But I think Cabell's really going to fit really well in the locker room. Uh, I think that's a big thing because Cabell at some sort of uh, point in time, he got really down on himself. And I think that was the biggest thing. When you get really down on yourself, I think you start to see him go downhill a little mm-hmm. bit. But when he's really happy and he feels like he's part of the locker room, you're going to see that 939 save percentage and that Vesna caliber goalie. So I think he's coming to the right place and I think he'll do really good. Uh, I like the contract. You know, it's kind of where we want Marks from the B at. I think we were trying to even get him at seven years for Marks from. So mm-hmm. I do quite like the five for five. I think it's a great deal. There's also a no trade clause on him as well. Uh, so it, it's definitely a big gamble, but I, I think it'll work out. Yeah. And, and, you know, another big signing that they made keeping a player was Evander mm-hmm. Kane returning um, what I think, given the way that he produced last year, is a very good contract. Four oh, yeah. years, a little over $5 million per for somebody who can be one of the premier power forwards in the NHL. We saw mm-hmm. the incredible goal production from him last season with Edmonton after signing and also carried it through the playoffs as well. Um, mm-hmm. you, you got to be excited about the way that Kane played and then having him back now and having a chance to build off of that. Yeah, I, I think I'm pretty excited about this because I was hearing rumors that we were going to get him at like seven for seven and it was going to be like a crazy contract. And I was like not up for it because no. a seven for seven for a cane was just it, it's just not realistic. Oh, we look don't how it worked be out signing. for the Sharks. Yeah, right. Like it, yeah. now there's still a lot of things to go on with the banner came with his arbitration. Apparently he's still going with uh, the arbitration with the shark. So if he ends up winning it, he could be property of the shark still. But this is a type of deal that I kind of wanted around the five million dollar range, mm-hmm. uh, especially being a point per game player who played really well with McDavid. And Kane's that type of player where he's a power forward. Usually yeah. power forwards decline a lot faster. So you don't want to lock him up to a seven for seven deal. You get him to a four year deal maybe his last year he's not as amazing as his first three years but Mm -hmm. this is kind of what i was thinking for a deal for evander kane a three to four year deal you know at a decent cap space around five million dollars which i think is what kane is worth uh and i think this is just an amazing job by ken holland to let kane test the market to see if anyone wanted to bite on him no one wanted to bite him uh bite on him at that type of cap and holland waited played patient and it worked out perfectly yeah, and I, I think Kane Kane has an opportunity, especially playing in that top six. You know you're going to be playing with great players with oh, yeah. Dry Saddle and McDavid. And, and Kane is that guy, I think, you know, that goes to the net, has the big body, isn't afraid yeah. to use it. And, you know, that kind of score that you need to have, especially with a guy like McDavid, who is, you know, so incredibly good at passing the puck, but he Mm -hmm. needs somebody to pass the puck to that can finish it off. And Kane has that finish. He's got a good shot. He goes to the dirty areas where you need to score goals. He can, you know, play net front. Um, You know, they got Hyman, you know, the, the off last off season. Now they get, Kane added in, you know, after the whole situation with San Jose, like, I feel like they've identified the kinds of scores that they need to put with McDavid and dry saddle and are finding those guys that can really produce well playing with those players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like we needed finishers for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Like you watch the Edmonton Oilers and you've seen two great players in McDavid and dry saddle, but you never really seen anyone surrounding those guys that could actually put up a solid amount of goals last year we had three other 20 goal scorers and it wasn't just you know mcdavid and leon carrying the team and i mean yeah they still produce massive amounts of points but having hyman scoring 27 kane with 22 he was on pace to almost have 40 goals that year yeah moto got up to 20 so i think even next year with 
the the more additions that we're getting and i've been even hearing phil kessel might be an yeah. edmonton oil on down the road as well from what i've been hearing so if we can continue picking up you know the goal scorers that will definitely help us out with our point production as well which i think will be uh, a big thing for the team yeah so another move that they that edmonton made and i'm sure that this was probably universally looked at as a good one mm-hmm. was they were able to finally shed zach cassian's contract um, yes and that that was a contract that you know edmonton's not a team that's loaded with cap space i mean they've got mm-hmm. a little room to work with with clef bomb going to ltir and whatnot but they're not they're not like in a situation where a team like Anaheim or New Jersey is in where they have this loads of cap space to work with. So to move on from a guy who had really fallen off a cliff the way that yeah. Cassian had uh, and get that contract out of there and that trade with Arizona, that's got to be another you know very important move that Ken Holland made. Yeah, I, I love this move uh, because the fact that, you know, yeah, we swapped first and we might have had to give up a, a third and a second, but those are future thirds and seconds. Mm-hmm. Those are like, those are picks that are later on down the road. We're going to be in the playoffs and it won't really affect us very much when you're going for, you know, a cup when you're trying to compete, you got to do these types of moves. You got to shake cap away. And Zach Cassian's that type of player that you had to shed the cap away, you know, $3.2 million for a guy that's only playing eight minutes, not doing too much out there. Even then, like he wasn't that much of a physical presence throughout the year. You know, you watch him, he was just basically floating around. So now you could go off to Arizona and float around there. (laughs) And I think, you know, the, even the draft pick and Reed Schaefer, a lot of people compared him to Zach Cassian. I do like what we got in our first round pick. I think, I think we could have got a little bit better, but for the deal, uh, I'm not complaining. Only having to give up a third and a second round pick to get rid of a bad contract. I'm mm-hmm. not complaining about that one. Yeah, a couple of uh, underrated moves, I think, that you know certainly didn't garner the attention necessarily, but I think are very solid moves. First, they bring back Brett Kulak, who mm-hmm. was uh, brought in you know, at the deadline last year and um, ended up, I think, I think Kulak's a very solid D-man that yeah. a lot of people don't know about. Yeah. And, and they, br- they bring him back on a four year deal, I believe. And yeah, then four year at uh, 2.75. Amazing yeah, deal. Not a bad cap pit at all. No uh, under three mil. And then Matthias Yanmark comes in at a very low risk, low cost contract mm-hmm. one year, 1.25 million. He had 25 points last year. If you get 25, 30 points out of a guy making 1.25 million, that's a pretty solid depth addition so uh, a couple of those moves, just your thoughts on them that are kind of more on the underrated side. Yeah, I really, really love Brett Kulak. I, mm-hmm. I was really impressed by the way he played alongside of Tyson Berry last year. I thought he made Tyson Berry look a lot better uh, than Tyson Berry without him. Uh, and I love the deal. Four years at 2.75. Uh, we were hearing rumors when he jumped into free agency that there was a lot of teams after Brett Kulak. Yeah. And that he was saying that his first option would have been going back to Montreal. And that was like kind of a concern because we're seeing Ben Sherratt and Erica Branson getting those big contracts. I was like, okay, Brett Kulak might be getting up around there and getting them at the cap hit we did get. I was at work seeing four years for $11 million. I was like, oh, Lord, did we ever just get a steal right here? Because yeah. Kulak could be our top four guy. And I still think we need one more left-handed defenseman up on that side. Mm-hmm. This defense still looks the exact same compared to last year, and we weren't amazing last year. Now, sure, Jay Woodcroft made our defensive core look a lot better, but I still think we're one defenseman away from making this team a real, real contender. Our offense is incredible, but mm-hmm. our defense still needs a little bit of work. Yep. And I think Kulak could be a great top four guy, but I think we still need that one guy to really solidify that defensive core. And for Matthias, uh, Matthias Yanmark, I love the pickup. Great uh, little defensive player, plays not too bad on the power play, plays on the PK. Uh, I'll be a good winger. I know people say he's a center, but I looked at his center. He doesn't really take any face-offs at all. I know Mm -hmm. sometimes Vegas had him at the uh, center spot on the depth chart, but he looks like he's mostly a winger, and he'll probably be playing up on the wing. And uh, honestly, at the cap it, low risk. Uh, and I think it'll work out pretty good. He was uh, formerly really good when he first played in Dallas yep. and he'll be definitely getting a lot less minutes. And I, I think he'll fit really well with the Edmonton Oilers. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with everything you said there. Um, RFAs, cause Edmonton does still have some work to do. Yeah. 
Ryan, Ryan McLeod, Kyler Yamamoto, and Jesse Poyarvi. Uh, mm-hmm. RFAs don't have contracts right now. I've I've heard there being, you know, there's a lot of Poyarvi talk right now. Yeah. There's some talk about, you know, Yamamoto, but I think the, the what I'm hearing is that they'd rather keep Yamamoto than Poyarvi if they yeah. had to choose between the two. So McLeod, I will personally say I was extremely impressed with last season. Oh, yeah. And I think that he's got to be their top priority out of those three to lock up. Um, oh, yeah. Because I think McLeod's got some real upside. And I, I wonder, you know, are they going to bring back all three or are we going to see a move here where maybe somebody gets traded out? Yeah, I think we're definitely most likely going to see a move. Now, in my opinion, I would love to keep all three of them. Mm-hmm. I really would love to because I'm a big fan of Pulley RV. I thought he was a great two-way guy for us this past season. I was, I'm always been a big fan of Yamamoto, and I love McLeod. Now, with Pulley RV and Yamamoto going into arbitration, that makes it a little difficult because if uh, you know if they go into arbitration, that means you have to make over four million dollars, which we just can't fit that into our cap or we only have like $5.6 million with Clef bomb and Smith being both on the LTIR. So we don't have a lot of space. Now I've been hearing Holland talking about trading away Pulley RV for a draft pick, which I think is ridiculous. If we're trading away Pulley RV, we better bring back in like a defenseman. Mm -hmm. That's a good caliber or something in that sorts, pick it up a pick. You you never know what's going to be the pick. And especially if we're a team that's competing, you want player for player. You don't want yeah. a player for a draft pick. If you're doing a player for a draft pick, you're a rebuilding team, mm-hmm. right? You want to, if you're training away a younger player, you want to pick up something that's going to help the team solidify itself. And honestly, if Yamamoto might help us get somebody like that, I, I don't see the point, like maybe trade away Yamamoto. Now, I think without a doubt, Ryan McLeod is definitely somebody we need to focus on signing. I think we could get him back at a decent cap hit as well and be our third line center this upcoming season because he, without a doubt, we need that type of guy. Mm-hmm. That's been our weakness over years, and McLeod was able to bring in a third line center. But I, I think to answer your question, I think definitely we're going to be seeing someone being traded out of these, uh, at least the two guys, either Pulley RV or Yamamoto. It's most likely Pulley RV. Yeah. I don't want it to happen, but it's most likely will. Yeah, uh, it feel, feels like they're kind of in a position where they've got to do something because, yeah, you know, with the cap space that they have, it's going to be hard to get everybody back. So they're going to have to de- make a decision. And it's a hard now, decision. I would like to see us trade away, try to trade away Fogel and Barry to clear up some more cap space. Because yep. I, I don't think we need playing. We don't need to pay Barry four point five million dollars to play on our third pairing when we already got Bouchard. Yeah. Who it was just amazing this past season yep. and will be amazing up on the top unit of our power play. Barry is without a doubt expendable and we really don't need him on the team and we could really shed that 4.5 million dollars of cap and move on from him and same with Fogel yeah do, do you think Broberg's ready to do something or does he still need a little more development um a lot of people are talking about Broberg right now and honestly he could be potentially ready I was really impressed with the way that he played this past season I was really calm and he played really good in Bakersfield too. Uh, Mm -hmm. In 31 games, he just posted 23 points. He had a really solid year in Bakersfield. So he could potentially make that jump without a doubt. Uh, And then we also have Slater Cuckoo as well. That might be ready to play in that third pair, which uh, I wasn't a big fan of him last year. So I I think right now with the way that we're not really talking, because I haven't heard any rumors about us making any moves for a left-handed defenseman. I think they most likely believe Broberg could potentially be ready this year. And that's the way I feel from a lot of fans right now is that Broberg could potentially be ready for this year. And I kind of feel that way as well. He had a solid 23 games played really simple hockey. And I think he could be uh, uh, playing up on that top six this upcoming year. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Last one for you. Just kind of overall outlook at this coming season. Obviously, you know, successful year last year overall, conference final. Like, where do you see this team? You know, are they still kind of around that same area of of produ- of where they're at? Do you think they've taken a step forward, a step back? How, how do you see next year come going for them? I definitely think we took a, a step forward here. Uh, I like the way that our depth is shaping up right now with adding in Yanmark, and we're apparently trying to add in some more depth. Mm -hmm. Uh, I still think we need to add a little bit of the defense. I think our defense is still very much something to be talked about, but if they really feel strong about Broberg, then Broberg could take a huge step up next year. Not even just that Bouchard, 
if they really feel like Bouchard could take another step up next year. And I very much feel like he can. He had an amazing season last year. I think he'll take another step up this year. So there's still a lot of question marks with their defense, still a lot of question marks with their goaltending. But even last year with our question marks with our goaltending with Smith and Koskinen and throughout the entire year, we were able to make it to the second uh, or to the conference finals. So I think that's around the same range that we'll be targeting again, the second to third round. And if we improve that defensive core massively and we pick up, you know, a real big top four defenseman that could play alongside either Bouchard and CC, a nice two-way player, I think then we could really solidify ourselves as a, a contender. And I think we're almost there, but we just need that one little piece to be added. All right. Awesome, man. Peyton, it was great talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, hopefully the Oilers have another great season this coming year. Oh, Any Anything you want to plug, anything where people can find you, have at it, my friend. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go check out my YouTube channel, Peyton on the radio. I talk all about the Oilers hockey, as you guys can see in the background. I got all the all, all the Oilers crap back there. Uh, also, go check out my Discord uh, as well. Uh, the link will be down in the description when you go check out my YouTube channel as well. Uh, and my Twitch, I've been streaming some video games up on there. That's just Peyton on the radio. And my uh, Twitter, Peyton, I think it's radio something i don't remember it go check it out on my uh description down below as well uh thank you uh, uh, uh john for having me on uh, it was a lot of fun i always love talking about the other so thank you for having me on awesome man thank you so much and everyone watching thank you so much for coming by and watching this video today it was awesome to get a chance to talk about the oilers hope you guys enjoyed it and i'll be talking to you all very very soon see you guys next time